Welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, they asked me, Jody Rogers from Jamp Software, to introduce one of our fine sponsors, Code42, from the beautiful city of Minneapolis, just down the road. And they asked me in particular, I think, because I have a long relationship with Code42. Uh, when I was in IT at Adobe, we were one of the first companies to implement them as a solution for our backup for 10,000 employees globally across the, uh, across the world. Um, we put a lot of, um, we stressed their uh, structure at the time and they were super professional and were able to meet our demands. Now, when I say demands, keep in mind these are people, engineers at Adobe that do testing of very large uh, graphic files, video files, um, Photoshop files, people that had terabytes worth of data that they wanted to back up um, all across the globe. And Code42 was there for us, so CrashPlan was a fantastic solution, and uh, I use it personally. And so that's my plug that what I wasn't even asked to give, but. Uh, Definitely have my experience with, with them, and I'm lucky enough to know Andrew for uh, a while. And so with that small introduction, I once, once again, I want to thank Code42 for being a sponsor. And Andrew, welcome. You. you really want to do the high five thing? It's, this is the weirdest thing I've ever, I don't know if I can be comfortable with this. What are they doing, baptisms over here? If you're lucky, don't back up. Don't fall in. I won't. I, I don't know where to stand, so I'll just stay right here. Um, so yeah, my name's Andrew Renz. I'm the principal architect for Code42, which is uh, an invented title that really just means um, the same amount of pay and more responsibility. So I'm sure you guys can all identify with that. Um, so I really am kind of an SE for the company, but I'm also on the product team for CrashPlan and share plan, and I get to go around the country and talk to our large enterprise customers and our education customers, both uh, primary, secondary, uh, like big school districts. We just did a very large deal with the state of Maine. Is anybody here from there? Nobody? Okay, good. <laughs> um, but that was an interesting project to work on. Uh, Crash plan is actually leaving um, the factories in China and in pre-installed on laptops that are getting sent out to all the kids in, in Maine, which was really fun. So uh, that was a fun project to work on. Uh, and then I go into different enterprises uh, and a lot of large education customers as well. Do we have any kind of higher ed folks in here? Are any of you familiar with the Internet 2 uh, initiative that's been going on over there? A little bit? Uh, Internet 2, just briefly, is a very high bandwidth, low latency, 100 gigabit uh, backbone that kind of connects the top 100 or 200 um, education institutions across the country. And Crash Plan was actually selected as their cloud backup, uh, or their preferred vendor for cloud backup. Uh, so we actually got to connect our cloud here in Minneapolis to the Internet 2 backbone uh, and lit up those links, I think, last week. Uh, and we've just been adding tons of education customers. It's great for them because they essentially get private cloud speed, you know, backing up to our cloud and all the other benefits and things like that. Um, but I get to take your guys' feedback to the product team and implement lots of new features and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to flip through this as fast as I can. What we're going to talk about a little bit is, of course, crash plan, so you guys know what that is, what we do well there. I'm not going to give you the whole product thing. That would be boring. I'd want to shoot myself, too. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get it into Casper uh, so you can configure the CrashPlan client to be either silently push installed or through self-service. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to give you a brief little preview of our new product that we released last week uh, called SharePlan. Does that sound good? Okay. So Code42, um, we are, I think as a company, really uniquely positioned for this bring your own device uh, and just the overall kind of the way that computing is happening inside of IT, where people are bringing their own devices in, this is more consumer technology, and the enterprise is really adjusting itself to kind of fit those types of devices. Um, we're unique 
because we actually run our million plus consumer cloud, million plus user consumer cloud, on the exact same version of CrashPlan Pro E that you can just go and download off of our website for free. Uh, it makes it really cool for us, because uh, we know that the stuff that helps us also helps you guys. Um, so both directions, uh, we end up helping each other. Uh, basically, our pain is your guys' gain, which is uh, really fun. Uh, we also get a lot of expertise in intellectual property and all that kind of stuff because we build our own cloud. Uh, we don't use Amazon. It doesn't work. Uh, and we like to actually build our own clouds because a single purpose cloud is really the best cloud. And what we're doing is data protection. Uh, and now we're also doing collaboration and sync as well. Uh, so you, to be able to build your own is really, really exciting. That also means that all the technology that we put in there and then we turn over to you guys so you can build your own private clouds and do all that kind of stuff, makes it work. Uh, you can't download the Amazon stack and run it internally inside of your enterprise. It just, it's not gonna work that way. It's the cloud, uh, so we get to do that. Uh, the last one on here is really just kind of our philosophy. We wanna always be an open platform, and I'm gonna talk about some of that stuff when we get to SharePlan, uh, and also some of the things that we do in CrashPlan, we've always built as an open API. So if you need to customize things, or get data out of it, we're not gonna lock it away from you. And we're also not gonna lock you into one type of architecture. If you wanna back up to our cloud and then take your cloud home with you, go for it. These are our kind of tenants of development. Uh, security first, always. Uh, everything that we do, uh, we wanna keep uh, really tight data security, really good data privacy. Um, and basically, everything that we do after that always has to follow rule one, which is security. Uh, we always want everything to be as reliable as possible, so essentially we don't trust anything. Uh, that's why we have technologies for multi-destination. Uh, we actually verify everybody's backup data in their archive at the byte level continuously, uh, so you know when you need to restore data, you're actually gonna get it back, because everybody knows backup without restore is useless. Uh, has anybody ever backed up to a tape and never been able to get the data back off? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, to us, by the way, tape is a four-letter word. Sorry, I had to. Um, we also want to make our products as simple and intuitive as possible. Again, we get some help here because we're literally giving you guys inside enterprises and education institutions uh, the same crash plan user interface that we put out to the world to millions of users and say $60 a year, unlimited data. So if we don't make it easy to use, our small support staff, we have like 50 people there, would literally cease to exist. Uh, we wouldn't be a viable company if we didn't make stuff easy to use. And that goes right back down to you guys. Uh, it's a lot easier to support that way, creates a lot of less tickets, uh, and we're gonna use a lot of the technologies under the hood to kind of automate as much as possible. Performance and scale, you know, we're gonna always do that. Uh, there's a lot of cool features that I won't necessarily have time to talk about today. Uh, but this is true cloud technology. Uh, so we have things like a data balancer where you can add additional CrashPlan servers, uh, and CrashPlan will actually see that as a bigger destination, and then load balance the existing archives and new ones across all those uh, new servers and things like that. Uh, and then we also want to be flexible. Again, private, hybrid, public, you choose. In fact, I think, yes, I do have a slide for that. Um, Basically, you get to choose where you want to store your data. Uh, if you want to bring your own server kind of hardware to the game, if you want to use our managed private cloud appliances uh, or our cloud. Our cloud is becoming more and more attractive for enterprises and education customers because uh, we have a very good uh, security model where we can essentially allow you to run your own private master server, uh, which does all of your encryption key escrow and things like that, and then securely stores data for everybody uh, in our cloud. Uh, but you still hold the keys, we mathematically have no ability to ever look at your data. Lots of folks like that, Salesforce, Genentech, uh, even Facebook is kind of going down that road right now with us as well. Uh, so essentially, you know, you get that one cost per user, unlimited data, you make it our problem, it makes it pretty easy. Um, just a little review, in the last six months we've done lots of new versions of CrashPlan. Um, some highlights in here that were kind of fun for us, uh, we now support third-party identity providers. Does anybody in here use third-party identity providers like Ping or Okta? Not yet, you're getting there? Does anybody in education use uh, like Shibboleth, single sign-on? Yeah, okay. Um, that was a big ask so we could get there. Uh, I think 
we're a little bit early, um, but doing stuff like that makes it even easier for your end users. They no longer even have to have a password to type in to crash blind. It just works, uh, which makes it fun. Uh, another thing that we added was an ability to use our API for legal discovery purposes. Uh, you can essentially ask our API, does this data fingerprint or MD5 file hash exist across this user's data? If so, can I see it? Can I restore it somewhere else? Uh, discover it, do things like that. So we're really kind of leveraging CrashPlan as a pickup truck of data uh, to get it into one spot and then to do other things with it. Does discovery ever come up? Ever, anytime you guys think about backup or all that kind of stuff? Yeah, we're not gonna build a discovery product. Uh, that's not the code 42 way. Instead, we're just gonna keep extending our APIs and things like that. Uh, last feature on here that's kind of fun for us is we have the ability to let you guys define what is a WAN and what is a LAN network. Uh, before, we basically said if it was a publicly routable address, uh, that was a WAN connection. If it was a private fake address, like a 192 or a 10 or whatever else, uh, we would throttle to the LAN connection. Now we actually allow you guys to define those networks so you can better manage bandwidth inside your network and outside. Uh, a good example would be the company we built this for was Pixar. Um, they deployed CrashPlan into a private cloud but put it in their border zone so it was accessible from the internet. Uh, and what they were seeing were people were starting their initial backups and they were doing no exclusions whatsoever. So hundreds of gigs sometimes for these big media files and stuff. People were taking their computers home um, and basically wondering why Netflix wasn't working as well. Uh, and they said, is there any way that we could throttle only the home connections, uh, but not all the other connections that we have here on campus uh, and stuff like that? And we said, yes, we can think about doing this. And we implemented uh, those network overrides for IP ranges. We're doing a lot. Uh, that was just the last six months. The next, next thing I wanna talk about is our API community. Uh, so we internally contribute a lot to build out our RESTful API so you can do different things with it, pull statistics out. Uh, Casper actually has extension attributes built into it using our API. Uh, we want to extend this as much as possible. Uh, and we thought, what better way to do it than start a community uh, up on GitHub? So you can go there today. We have lots of examples in there for doing things like discovery uh, through all of your, your crash plan data, moving users around, deactivating them, things like that. And this is going to be the basis for how we keep building out additional capability outside the scope of CrashPlan and SharePlan out there, uh, just on our, our website. Uh, this will also be the basis for our next generation report builder. Everybody always loves reports. You generate them. Nobody reads them ever again, but you just have to do it. It's one of those things you check off at work. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of get those things open sourced a little bit. We'll provide some guidance, and then you can download them and customize them and save them and run them whenever you need to. So where are we going? Uh, this is always a big question for us. So what does the crystal ball look like for crash plan in the next six months? More Java. That's definitely what we want to be doing. Um, we're going to continue being Java forever and ever. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. Jody dared me to last night uh, over beer. Yeah, so, I can see why I released a new version of Java this yeah. morning. Yeah, exactly. We want <laughs> to put it mildly, we are running away from Java with our hair on fire right now. Okay? Um, it is our intention to be native across all the platforms that we support uh, as soon as possible. SharePlan, which is actually the next generation platform that we're releasing was released two weeks ago, and it is native. Uh, the next version of CrashPlan, CrashPlan 4, is literally using the exact same engine. Uh, we just have to tune it specifically for doing just backup instead of share and sync and things like that. Uh, but that's what we are doing. So we're not only going to go away from Java, but we're going to go completely native and take full advantage of being native on all these platforms. So Notification Center, uh, I'll show you some of that stuff in SharePlan in a minute if we can, if we have time. So. No Java, I promise. Uh, we will be native. Um, our focus really is a much smaller memory footprint uh, and speed. So we're actually hooked into FS events, things like that, so we can actually pile through that data much, much faster than we could before uh, to be able to provide a much quicker backup experience. 
Um, and this is just kind of a wireframe picture of what we were working on for the crash plan uh, four. We wanted to make this an even simpler experience for end users, more interaction through the menu bar, uh, some more previews and things like that of data where possible, uh, and all that kind of stuff. If you take a picture of this and post it on Twitter, I will kill you. Um, here we go. So we're also going to, as much as possible, embrace the idea of mobile data protection. On iOS, we are limited. We're severely limited by what Apple gives us in the APIs. Uh, at a minimum, we will be able to view all the data that has been protected, just like the current version of the CrashBlend mobile app, uh, but also selected data protection. So it's really stuff like your address book, your camera roll, and other things that we can access. On Android, we are actually going to treat these as fully functioning computers, basically. It's the same version of SharePlan that we'd have on any other computer. It has sort of a file system, so we're building our own browser and things like that. Uh, but you can actually protect an entire Android device with CrashPlan Mobile in the future. Uh, Windows Phone 8, asterisk, we don't know what we want to do there. Uh, their APIs are always in constant motion. Uh, we're not really sure <laughs> if a lot of those devices exist. Do you guys see Windows 8? devices, Windows Phone 8 devices out there anywhere? OK. You have one, but you don't support it. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's TBD. Um, we'll see where we go. We also want to add pin protection where possible. So per application, you can actually enforce a pin in addition to like an Active Directory password to access that data. Uh, and we will be making these things enterprise deployment capable. So if you have MDM solutions and you want to push down preferences or take away access to applications or lock down the open in functionality or whatever else, we will be putting that into the Crash Blend Mobile. Um, really briefly, so Crash Plan 4 and SharePlan share the same engine. Um, I joke and call this engine 2.0 and say it's you know a high horsepower thing. Basically, what we want to do is have a single native engine for both CrashPlan and SharePlan, um, but separate UIs for those. CrashPlan is one of those things, backup, it should just run invisibly all the time. You never really want to interact with it until you want to pull data back. SharePlan, you do. You're collaborating with people with it. Uh, you need to create additional plans and things. Uh, so we want to have separate UIs for those, but one engine. So really, it's lift once and then fork the data wherever it needs to go uh, on the back end. Uh, we are also adding support so you can run green and black at the same time. Green to us means consumer, black is enterprise or pro, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we've had a lot of input from our enterprise customers and education who want to use CrashPlan at work uh, and then take their machine at home and also protect their personal data with green. Uh, so we'll be able to do that. Uh, and the other big ask, a lot of this is coming from the education space, is the ability to protect multiple profiles at the same time, so each of those users can log in and restore their own data. That's the high level there. Uh, Archive 2.0, as I call it. Uh, really, this is a back-end change for us. Today, we are device archives uh, in the very near future. Uh, actually, it's already there in SharePlan. But we will be um, essentially a single user archive for all of the, the devices you might own. We're, today, we're already user-based licensing. You can have as many devices as you want. And then we just want to merge the archive together in the back end. That means we don't have to store any additional data uh, if you give somebody a second computer or you're migrating them or whatever else. Uh, it also means that any of the personal sync data, part of your share plan, basically, if you think of Dropbox, all that stuff is already there. If you've backed up the machine, we don't have to store or push any amount uh, more of data or anything else. Uh, we're also moving away from Blowfish. Is anybody sad about that? Nobody? I didn't think so. Uh, we are moving to AES-256 encryption, mainly because this is the s accepted industry standard uh, so that the NSA can look at your data. No, I'm kidding. Um, via Java. Via Java, exactly. No, that is, uh, that's really, you know, it's an accepted industry standard. Uh, we want to be FIPS and FedRAMP certified, and that's the first step to do that. It also means that there are certain data types that CrashPlan can now be used to protect, where we weren't able to do that before. Um, and Archive to All also means that SharePlan, uh, when it's actually storing a group collaboration plan, as we call it, is actually on the back end storing its data in what's called a multi-user archive. It's essentially a CrashPlan archive of everything that's ever happened, synced across all those users and everything on the back end, uh, except for multiple users. 
Uh, so user archives, obviously. The other big change that we're doing is we're moving to uh, a very, I'll geek you out, but basically variable length segment deduplication. Today we're variable block. Variable length is the same type of really expensive technology you would get with like an EMC Avamar or whatever, but we're just gonna stick it into the crash plan client. This means, you know, in our early testing, we're probably gonna save between 30 and sometimes up to 50 or 60% more additional space savings than we are today, uh, just by kind of moving to this. Uh, there's just a little bit of background info. We <laughs> actually hired a data scientist to look at big data sizes, you know, in our cloud and stuff like that. And what we saw were the biggest files that you would think you'd want to deduplicate the most of, ISOs and things like that, are the least frequently stored across your cloud. Uh, and when we started to think about it a little bit more, we realized that there's a a real and significant physics of data, if you want to think of it as, as that way. So big files have a lot of inertia. Um, they're very not likely to get duplicated across a bunch of machines. Um, so you typically don't really want to worry about those. Instead, you want to focus on the other files that you can dedupl deduplicate more. That said, if you can turn on cross-cluster deduplication, it's most effective on those very big files and not the really small ones, like one megabyte and things like that. Uh, but we really were interested in understanding this because something like SharePlan, if you turn it on, we're essentially rewriting the physics of data because big files can sync across your devices and across users very, very quickly. So we wanted to look at that and be able to provide an option for cluster-wide dedupe. Uh, data loss prevention is something that we've done previously in CrashPlan. Does anybody currently have a CrashPlan master server out in the border zone so it's publicly accessible from the internet? Okay, yeah. So we're essentially doing reverse IP lookups. Uh, I sat in a session yesterday about, I lost my laptop, where did it go? Uh, we do that today. We can basically put you on a map uh, as long as the client can obviously reach the, the CrashPlan master server. Um, that's because we're an always connected engine. So something like Casper is good, but it's actually polling every once in a while. CrashPlan is literally going to connect any time it can. Uh, so you can actually see updates in real time and actually send it command and control messages. So we want to kind of use that uh, and extend uh, a little bit as, as well. Uh, we are adding some remote data kill capability to CrashPlan and also SharePlan. Um, I'll talk about that when we go to, to SharePlan too, but basically any bit of managed data, we want to give you guys as administrators the ability to pull the rug out and get rid of it off those endpoints. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so this is, I'm going to transition a little bit and then I'll go back to, to SharePlan. So how many of you guys today deploy or use CrashPlan and then also deploy it with Casper? A few of you? Yeah, I know you do, Ryan. Um, how many use CrashPlan um, but haven't got so far as to deploy it with Casper? A few of you? Okay, so this is, this is topical data. Uh, this is literally, no joke, the exact same slides I had last year uh, except simplified a little bit more because nothing has really changed. Uh, it was a big change last year. We kind of revved the CrashPlan version and things like that, um, but some useful information in here for everybody. So custom installers for us, we're just a package. We are a flat package. Um, so what we wanted to do is make it easy to customize the little bits of information inside that package from elsewhere. So you can actually write down your customizations either next to the, the, P, the package installer in the disk image uh, or actually put them down into like the library application support folder of your machine and it'll actually read it in during the installer runtime. Um, you can download the customizations directly from your CrashPlan server or you can actually go on our website and do it there if you need to, uh, but we make it as easy as possible to do. Uh, there's also uh, like a customizer shell script uh, that's been kind of tagging around a little bit. I don't know if we've updated it very much. Uh, but that shell script actually even has the capability to build and customize a Windows installer as well. So I'm sure you guys have some of those devices. Uh, this would also help you. So why Casper? Uh, I think we've all beat the monolithic image horse to death and then cut the head off and buried it and all kinds of different things. Um, so we kind of all understand that it's best and easiest to write down something like CrashPlan after the machine is up and the user is present through some type of policy or self-service ad, that kind of thing. Um, post user also means that the user is there so we can attempt to identify them and match them to an Active Directory or LDAP account. How many of you guys use Active Directory? 
All right, I'll do that a different way. Is there anybody on open directory? Yes. Is that it? All right, cool. Well, either way, we speak LDAP, uh, so it really doesn't matter. Um, but we can essentially match those users that are on that machine to one of those network directory accounts uh, and automatically log them in, which we're going to talk about in a second, too. Uh, the other reason that you would definitely want to deploy CrashPlan through Casper is you have the de facto inventory of all your machines in Casper. In CrashPlan, it's going to be nothing. At most, CrashPlan is going to show you all the machines that have CrashPlan installed, which probably during the deployment phase is not very useful to you at all. Uh, so when you have inventory, you know the machines that have had CrashPlan installed in them or have previous versions or whatever else. Uh, Casper also offers extension attributes, which use our API to read in backup statistics so you can see who has backed up, who has not. Maybe you need to remediate, maybe push down the CrashPlan installer again, all those types of things. Uh, so yeah, all that nice reporting stuff. So the process overview, really, uh, for deployment is a two-step process. Um, I'm gonna, I can't even read that from over here, so I'm going to stand and not try and fall in that. Is this a, wait, am I too far? Is it okay? All right. Um, essentially, what you want to do is write down the custom directory through Casper first uh, into the library application support directory. So then when you run the installer package, which will push down and do all that kind of stuff. It'll actually read that custom directory, go through there, and pull in the customized bits from our custom properties file. Uh, you're definitely going to want to run that as the user instead of, uh, well, you're going to run it as root and then actually have the installer kind of identify the user that way. Uh, there is an option, too, if you need to, to touch a little file in there uh, if you really do want the crash plan service, if you want to call it that to run as the user. Most of the time, we want to run as the system, so you can select any amount of data on there. Uh, but if there's any data security concerns or whatever, you can use that file right there to force the CrashPlan install to run as the user. Essentially, it's the launch D as the user versus launch D as library. Um, you also need to set up LDAP. So if you want somebody to be automatically registered uh, after you push them the CrashPlan package, uh, we will need to be able to match somewhere on their machine to a username in your directory services. If it doesn't match, you have some options. You can essentially deny them access to your CrashPlan server, or you can just basically put them into a mismatch org that says, OK, I didn't figure out who this user was as best as I could, but I still want to grab them, see them in CrashPlan, and then maybe remediate after that fact. Uh, you also definitely want to check your default client settings to make sure that the destination for any of the orgs that they're going to come in at are basically auto start enabled. What that really means is as soon as the CrashPlan client is installed, uh, it'll do a quick scan of all the files it needs to protect uh, and then start backing up. If you don't use that option, the CrashPlan client will just sit there with a start button that says start backup. Uh, so you definitely want to have the auto start enabled. Uh, and then really choose what file inclusions and exclusions you want to do. Do you want to grab the user profile? Do you want to grab more, like the entire hard drive, and start excluding things? Make those choices. Also make choices around what preferences do you want to lock away from end users or let them customize. Uh, I always advocate making as many choices on behalf of your users as possible. Um, that way, you basically give them less rope to hang themselves. So custom.properties, uh, there's just a few text fields in here that you'll en essentially enter. The main thing for you guys to remember if you want the CrashPlan client to register the user and start backing them up automatically is to use the deferred password option. What that essentially does is tell the CrashPlan client to match the user on that machine to a user in LDAP uh, and then give them a deferred password so we can essentially start protecting them with what kind of looks like a one-way encryption key. Um, to the end user, it really means that if they click on the desktop, uh, then they'll actually type their password to you know, access, restore, change settings, or whatever else. But from a silent and invisible install perspective, it's done. We registered the user. We're going to start protecting them with nothing uh, for them to do. There's also some options in here for starting the desktop. Like after you push it, do you want the CrashPlan app to pop up, or do you just want to do it silently? Most folks who do the silent push install really do want to keep it silent, um, but you can make those choices. 
The user info.sh is the file that basically controls the push installer. Uh, that's where you'll define what variables we're going to read in for the user, uh, and also you know, where the user home is. So essentially, you know, the JAMP documentation and the one that we have on our website says the best way if you're installing a package as root or whatever else, but you want to identify the user is let's look at the last logged in user and tr attempt to identify and match them to an LDAP account. Will it work 100%? Probably not. Uh, so we have some other options we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then really, you know, what is their home directory? Uh, there's different ways to do this. Uh, if you're experienced in Bash or whatever, we can read different things. Um, you know, most of the time, users and then the username will probably work. There's some other examples in here. So, you know, sometimes just doing the last logged in user is not going to be as appropriate as literally looking at the last 50 logged in users and then counting who was the most logged in uh, so it doesn't get you or any of the other remote help desk users or whatever else, uh, and then taking that uh, and turning it into the user variable. Uh, and another way to actually read the user home directory is to actually use uh, DSCL to actually look at their record. This is useful if you allow folks to essentially put their home folder on an external hard drive or something, uh, so you can grab that that way. Any questions on these? Okay. Uh, <laughs> here's an example I showed last year. Um, I challenge you to type it all down really quick. In fact, if you do, I have swag for you. Okay. Uh, but this was a very sophisticated user info.sh script that uh, we had to develop for one of our customers uh, because they were really concerned of basically installing CrashPlan and identifying the wrong user. So we just built a whole bunch of logic in there to basically say, is this a system IT account? If so, let's not do that, and a whole bunch of different stuff. The takeaway for you guys is because this is just a shell script, you can go hog wild crazy, uh, which makes me excited. Um, essentially anything is possible doing this. I've seen other options too where literally in the user info.sh it's doing LDAP searches uh, to try and figure out who the LDAP user is and match different things that way. Are there any questions on this? Yeah. Question I may have missed this. I apologize. Sure. These are scripts inside the installer package. Yeah. It's the, mm -hmm. files inside that. Yeah. These are actually contained in the custom directory. Um, so the installer package for CrashPlan is Gatekeeper, so it's essentially compiled with our certifi certificate and all that kind of stuff. So you don't want to open it up and then mess around unless you really like repackaging and putting your cert back in there. So instead, we basically just put all the customizations in the custom directory, which will then get read in during the installer runtime. Yep. So you, that's why it's kind of a two-step process. You write down the custom directory through Casper, and then you essentially run the package. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so that's it. Um, we'll come back and have some time for questions and things like that. But what I wanted to do really briefly was give you a high-level preview of what SharePlan is. Does anybody want to know about SharePlan? Do you care? A bunch of people? OK. <laughs> I'm going to stand down. Uh, I guess here will work fine. This is the weirdest thing I've ever stood on. I'm kind of getting weirded out. Yeah. Um, so what is SharePlan? SharePlan is a secure, uh, enterprise-grade file sync and share platform uh, that's really built to empower users to kind of collaborate on their files uh, and amongst themselves so they can essentially see data wherever they need to and also enable um, all that group stuff that we like to do. Uh, at the same time, it's easy to use by end users, um, but as administrators, you have all the ability to kind of see, view, and control what is actually being shared uh, and even remotely pull the plug on things like uh, who has access to what plan and things like that, all remotely. Uh, the cool part is this is, SharePlan is, it's a 1.0 product. We don't actually call it that. This is actually 4.0 for us. Uh, this is the next generation platform from Code42. Uh, CrashPlan 4 will be using this as well, so we got this out the door. Um, really, what we wanted to do was let you guys choose your topologies uh, does anybody use any other enterprise file sync and share things like Box? Does anybody use Dropbox Teams? Syncplicity, right? Well, there's a lot of different options out there. 
Uh, what we really wanted to do was take the Code42 DNA of choice and bring that to the share and sync market. Uh, so you can choose. Do you want to do private cloud? Do you want to do hybrid cloud? Uh, do you want to do public? Do you want to mix and match? Uh, all those capabilities are in SharePlan. Uh, we also wanted to make it native so you can access and collaborate on data from any of the devices that you could support in your enterprise. And to that extent, we realized that self-service and BYOD a lot of times means people are bringing in their own devices. Um, and if you allow them to see some of that work data or whatever else on there, and then they lose the device, or maybe you don't, they, you don't want to have access to that stuff anymore, how do you kill the data without actually killing the entire device? Right? It's there. You don't want to wipe the entire thing. Uh, so we built a lot of functionality in there so we can remotely kill just the managed bit of data no matter where they picked it up and moved it on their machine. The other thing that we realized um, very, very quickly was every enterprise, and I use the term enterprise for education and, and actual enterprises interchangeably, but they have different ideas for what sync and share and collaborate mean. They also probably have different tools. They might have SharePoint. Does anybody use SharePoint? Who, okay, let me rephrase that. Who has SharePoint? Who uses SharePoint? That's what I thought. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of different things inside of an enterprise that they might want to integrate with. And so we both wanted to be native on, our, on all the devices that you guys have. Uh, we also wanted to have a lot of integration points with different technologies and stuff like that that are already in place, like SharePoint or whatever it is. And the answer for us was we needed to take the hard road out, or the hard way, or whatever that expression is. So what we decided to do was basically create our own API uh, that we wanted to use for sync and collaborate and all that kind of stuff, and then build all of the SharePlan applications on top of our own API. A lot of the other competitors in the market and stuff like that, they've added on an API so they can do other things later. We started with an API so we can do that. So in, in a few examples. Um, as a demonstration for one of our early customers, they wanted, does anybody use Jive? Does anybody use Jive? Nobody, except for you guys? I didn't think so. Uh, Jive is kind of like Facebook for enterprise. Is that a really bad description? That's a okay. Facebook Yeah. Uh, but what, they, what we wanted to demonstrate was the capability to create a group inside of a completely different platform, Jive, and have that ripple back through into SharePlan. Uh, and we can do that because we are API based. It also means that if you guys uh, want to build your own applications on top of SharePlan, Maybe you need an email attachment replacement, or you want to have an internal-only corporate Evernote. You can use our open source API and build those tools, and we'll be able to handle all the objects and the permissions and the security and stuff like that on the back end. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do was basically give you real-time view and administration of all that share plan data. Uh, and we basically did that by extending the existing crash plan admin console. Um, SharePlan, just like something like Dropbox, you have a directory there. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but you can essentially have any bit of data managed by SharePlan. Uh, we have a real-time file watcher from CrashPlan. We thought, why not reuse that again? Uh, so you can be flexible in the way that you work and pick up those files and, and directories and put them where you want to. Uh, we have no limits on the number of files uh, or the size of files that you want to actually sync across devices or within a group. But we knew there was a lot of limitations in other services that way. We didn't want to do that. Uh, we, of course, wanted to be silent and continuously sync all this data. Uh, we're doing this in real time. You also get access from anywhere, obviously. Uh, and it's a lot of self-service administration for creating a plan, adding their own users, uh, and collaborating and things like that as well. Um, this is my terrible drawing for what sync and share kind of do. Uh, but really, it's about getting your data across the devices that you own and across you know, the individuals inside of a group project. Uh, and there's also what we call sync or share, which is really the one way I need to get this file out to somebody one time. Uh, and that's also covered in here. Plans are basically anything that are managed by SharePlan uh, with the associated group or person membership and permissions and things like that and the files that are contained therein. Uh, they can be managed in place, uh, or you can actually move them around and do things like that. Uh, some really cool technology under the hood. So SharePlan actually has a topology-aware network. So it can actually discover intelligently your, your peer network. 
uh, which in practice means that all the bits of data don't have to go up to the share plan server and then down to all 20 uh, collaborators. It can go up to the share plan server, down to one of them on the same LAN, and then to the other 19. Uh, it makes it to actually be a very lightning fast way of sharing data. It's also really, really efficient across WANs and things like that. Uh, our marketing term for this is LAN if you can, WAN if you must. Uh, it's very nice that way. The other thing that we're doing is, just like CrashPlan, we're deduplicating uh, at the byte level, but now we're doing it across users. So if we're all collaborating on the same file and I save a change, only the byte differences will get moved to each of you. Very, very efficient way of moving data around and collaborating on it. Uh, we also have a concept of an anticipatory cache. So SharePlan essentially is looking at the files that you're working on and collaborating on the most, and it's going to cache those first uh, and let you kind of have icon stubs and things like that intelligently. Um, we're also battery and resource aware, 3G, no 3G, all the mobile apps, you can turn that on and off if you need to. And of course, you can do all the remote control uh, from the admin console. Security stuff, it's all over the place. <laughs> I I'd rather just show it to you if that's possible. Um, the only thing on here is the remote, remote wipe of managed data uh, and all the key management. So today in CrashPlan, everybody gets their own key. For SharePlan to function in a group, each plan has to have its own key that they then share. Uh, and so all that stuff is handled under the hood. Who wants to see it? Does it should we just do it? OK. Uh, well, the first thing I want to show you is uh, Code42 as a company. Uh, actually does use Casper Suite, um, and we have a self-service portal. It's yours. Uh, so we have all of those options. And depending upon how you want to deploy CrashPlan, you can do this as a silent push install policy, or you can actually stick it inside self-service. So folks can come in here and hit the install button, and it'll actually get pushed down that way. We have Marathon? <laughs> wow. Oh, OK. Cool. Uh, so that this is a self-service portal. This is our real live one uh, on my managed machine. So it is possible to do this. I'll go ahead and close it. Get rid of this guy. So here is SharePlan, uh, the user interface. And I'll switch over here, too. So it's a very simple concept um, where you can essentially manage data in place, just like you're used to in something like Dropbox. Um, but any of these directories or plans or whatever else are being watched by the share plan process. So if we look at our big project here, uh, we can see the contributors. Um, again, we're native, so we're tied into all the cool native things that we can do in OS X. So everything has quick look previews built into it. Um, it also has a notification center. Uh, built in. So if you look down here, here's SharePlan. It'll tell you uh, if two files were added, and it'll actually take you directly to those um, as you manage it. If somebody added you to a plan or they made changes or whatever else, you get the notification center. You can click on it, dismiss it, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so you can manage it in place from the Finder. We're doing a little bit of Finder code injection because that's how you, everybody has to do it these days uh, to indicate sync status uh, of different files and things like that. Uh, so you can see that this is a uh, directory and all that kind of stuff. Um, it has built-in conflict management, so if both people save at the same time, you know, we can see the differences there. On the back end, SharePlan is literally keeping record. It's like a court stenographer, really. So everybody that has been contributing or making changes to files or adding files or different versions or everything else are being collected. Uh, in the back end in the share plan archive. So you could actually remove access from everybody uh, in that share plan and still have everything that happened inside of that plan in the archive on the share plan server. So a year from now, if you need to go in and discover whatever you need to, it would all be um, part of that share plan archive. Um, so here's our big project. I can go over here. I can see the directories. Uh, the neat thing is here's the directory that is that plan. Uh, the share plan directory is kind of my landing zone, uh, but this can actually, I can pick it up and drop it on my desktop, and it will stay managed by share plan. Again, we're watching the file system in real time, so you can pick up, you can essentially work the way that you're used to. A lot of folks were really interested in this when we were kind of doing the early versions, uh, and it makes it really nice. You know, myself, I have a projects directory, so if stuff comes into me on the share plan, I can pick it up and put it back in my projects directory and continue working on my file system the way that I'm used to. See if I can get to the admin console. 
Uh, so really this you know, share plan user interface is for adding additional users to plans. Uh, we're basically doing lookups uh, through directory services. If you add somebody, uh, it'll actually come across there. Uh, we also have sync selections. So you can choose if you want the data as part of that plan to get synced to your devices or not, just want to be notified of the events and then pull it down later. Uh, all that stuff is in there that way. Where it is? Let's see if we can get here. So there's two parts to the web console uh, for our share plan. There is the admin console, which I'll go to now. Does anybody use Crash Plan today? Yeah, so this will look really familiar for you, uh, except it has some new bits, plans, essentially, here. Um, it, was, it was a big project, right? Our big project. Yeah, let's get rid of that. So I'm a member of this project, uh, but I have now logged into the admin console as uh, an administrator. And I can actually look at all of these plans. Is this the big launch? No. There it is. So this is a plan um, remotely from the admin console. And here's me. Uh, remotely, as an administrator, if I want to remove Andrew from having access to this plan, I can actually click this and say, OK. Uh, and if we watch back really quickly to share plan, uh, it's already gone. And also, the directory that I picked up and moved out of the share plan directory on my desktop is also gone. Uh, so you have full remote data kill capability. Uh, as an administrator, if you want to add access back to, for somebody or a different person, uh, you can go ahead and add users this way. Of course, it's all drivable by LDAP if you want to do that. Um, really, what we're kind of doing is letting users create plans and inviting users themselves, and then giving you guys access from the IT side to control who has access to what. Does it make sense? Yeah. Um, so uh, I see you can add people by LDAP. Can you scope uh, groups? Of course. Yeah, so plans are owned by organizations, just like they are, just like users are kind of owned by organizations in CrashPlan. Uh, so you can essentially scope them to groups or any other LDAP attributes. Maybe it's a person attribute, says that I work in marketing or whatever else. Um, and this is, you know, we basically got SharePlan out the door two weeks ago, and we're going to continue to iterate this. So there'll be additional functionality that we can do here. Maybe you want to limit what data types are getting uh, synced across devices, right? Do you want .dmg to get synced, or do you want folks to only have, you know, five gigabytes of personal sync data or whatever else? All those controls will be built into here. Uh, but it's managed literally from the same admin console as CrashPlan, so you can see all the users and devices and things like that that way. Cool. Um, I would show you Windows, but this is Jamf, so we'll go ahead and skip that. What about uh, external users? Yeah. So external users, uh, it's a great question. They can either be fully participating collaborators by having a SharePlan account uh, on your SharePlan server and using your SharePlan apps. If you do that, you maintain control of their data, right? So if you want to revoke access, it'll literally get removed from their file system and things like that. Uh, or you can essentially do the one-way share. So uh, one-way share is more like you're going to give them a link, and then they can download it over the web or whatever else. Uh, that's easy to do. Uh, so there's a web app part of SharePlan, just like there's a native app. Uh, they would essentially get a very simplified version of this web app so they can go in and see all those files and download them as they need to. And so if they're full members, then uh, SharePlan administrator would have to create the user Right? Is that true for one-way share as well? No, one-way share is you're essentially emailing them a link. Then so it's what, one. Be a replacement for secure email then. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So here's here's my web view into my data. Uh, here's all my files, uh, and I can even go ahead and click on these and download them, you know, straight through the web console this way. Uh, and by the way, I was really honest when I was telling you guys that there is an API for this, so you can actually. Like invite people to plans through an API call. Uh, you can remove members to plans. Um, you can add files to plans from the API. Uh, you can do lots of different things all through uh, our open source API that way. OK? Um, do you want to start handing the mic around for questions? Yeah. I'll wait until I... Yeah, so I had a quick question. Um, so if you 
have a group of users that belong to a plan, then can you kind of have other groups access that plan but just like not contribute? So if you have like a marketing group that has resources to share with the sales team? Yeah. So it's the question is really about you know hierarchy and what permissions do you want to give them? So owner, read, read, write, et cetera. Uh, and any directory that is part of a plan can also be a plan itself. And you could say, just this marketing collateral directory, let's give read only access to a bunch of different people. Sure. Awesome. Basically create those. Do, do you want to go ahead and, and jump into yeah, Q&A? Yeah, let's do QA. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. You want to take some sip of that monster drink? Uh, yeah, why not? It's like, do you want to breathe oxygen? Yes. <laughs> I do. So, uh, so we're uh, starting a training program, and uh, I'm wondering about using this as a media repository. Um, and can they stream straight for that, or do they actually have to download? And also, c will it uh, kick out URLs so we can have an external users actually look at some of the media, media if we want customers to eventually look at our media for training? OK. Um, so this is sync with cache. So it essentially does have to come down onto the file system or have an icon stub so they click on it and then initiate the the transmission that way. Um, you could use our API to essentially provide access directly to a file that way. Uh, but the real answer is that everything that is stored inside SharePlan is actually locked in an encrypted archive. So you can't directly access it through a URL or anything else. Uh, but you could essentially use our API to decrypt things on the fly or provide links or whatever else if you need to do that. The next question comes from me. Yeah. Uh, there is separate versions of crash plan, yeah. uh, an, uh, an enterprise version and a consumer version. So share plan, you presented it to us at least as an enterprise solution. Is it both? Uh, share plan today is really built for our current crash plan pro E customers. So these are businesses or education customers or whoever else. Um, I won't comment on our future plans for a consumer version of share plan. Uh, there are definite you know, synergies between these, and we might do that at some point. Um, but that's as much as I can say it. Cool. Okay. Um, so hopefully a couple of questions. Yeah. On, on crash plan, sure. um, the, in the space that we're in dealing with the uh, kind of managed services area, a lot of our customers are used to using retrospect. Yeah. and doing the, that local backup to hard drive sets and everything. Yep. And um, whether or not we can even restore from a hard drive sometimes is questionable too, but um, how do we, uh, um, the, the price difference between crash plan and the, the company buying retrospect is, is, uh, can be significant. Sure. Um, so can you give me any clues for yeah. helping people understand the value there? Yeah. Well, really, you want your data in multiple locations, right? Uh, we have a really efficient cost model for protecting unlimited amounts of data per user to our cloud. So it's off-site. It's away from the external hard drive that would also be consumed in the fire when the building burned down and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you can also have a second destination. You could use that hard drive uh, as a very fast local destination for backup as well as the cloud at the same time. Or you can build a private cloud. Uh, as a managed service provider, you can actually be a, essentially an agent partner of ours, uh, where we would slice up a section of our cloud that you would have full admin control over, uh, and then have each of your companies or whoever else as little organizations in there and be able to remotely you know, change file selections and do remote browse and restores and things like that that way. So it's me too. Hi, my name is Andrew. I've been a retrospect user for seven years. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's kind of coming from that. Um, it's a completely different game. The biggest difference between us and a lot of those other things is we're continuous, we're encrypted, we're deduplicating. Uh, we have mobile applications, and it's a true platform to integrate into Casper and a lot of other things that way. OK. And then as far as the, the different options, because you had the consumer and the pro and the pro E, can you use the consumer version for the workstations and is there a way to kind of fudge that around so it doesn't cost so much with a different uh, type of ver <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You'd be violating our EULA 
uh, to use the consumer version for business use. But the thing that you would not get, uh, which you would still always want, is that admin top-down view of all the devices and organizations that you need to control and see statistics for and, and change settings. If you're using consumer, you have no web console. Uh, so you can't do anything remotely. Uh, that's probably the biggest difference that way. Cost-wise, we're pretty much the same across all of them, unless you're using a family plan to back up like 10 machines or whatever. You can't, you can't use the API as well then, right? Yeah, there's not much you can do in the consumer version. Um, I've got a bunch of users on Dropbox for Teams, and one thing that they're always having an issue with is have someone with a file that's open, and then someone else opens the file, and then they save the file, and you get the conflicted copies thing. And, yeah. um, because this, it sounds like it's constantly monitoring files, is there a way to just simply lock a file so that if someone else opens it, it is not accessible to anybody else until they've released it? File locking is tough. Um, yeah, I know. The real answer for you is SharePlan is collaboration and not content management. There's a real greasy slope that we slip into when we start locking files and things like that. Uh, the real answer is that the way that we're spitting out uh, basically those conflict files was a very 1.0 way of doing it. What we actually want to do is version everything and then let you choose which version by which contributor you would like to actually view at a given time. Okay. That's where we're going. Do you know any ETA on that? Probably in the next six months. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Let me pass the mic. So I have a few um, uh, crash plan questions, but I'll just cool. ask one for now. This way um, everybody yeah. gets a chance. Um, so I've been trying to get my hands on the custom folder um, for the last couple weeks. I worked with support. Um, for some reason, when I go to my server address and um, I, I use HTTPS, uh, port 4280, 4285, the, the page always comes up as cannot be found. So is there an easier way for me to get this? I've been working with support for like a week and I just can't yes. get the answer to it. Uh, go to our documentation. Over here. And if you go to customizing the desktop, there's a link right in the middle of the page, I promise, that says download it here yourself uh, or get it right off of our website and it'll bring down a little custom.zip, okay. and you can do it that way. The other way, to do you run this on your own CrashPlan server? Yes. Do you have access to the file system? Oh, yeah. So everything, all these links up here correspond to folders that are written down on the file system inside the pro server directory. Okay. So you could open up that package and then go right down into it if you Copy want to. From there. Okay, I'll pass it on and come back to the others. Thank you. Cool. We've got just a couple minutes left, so we just answer a couple quick questions. Uh, how many administrators are allowed and what control can each of those administrators have to a crash plan account? Unlimited number of administrators. Um, we currently list out every single possible permission in our role builder. So I think it's something like 100 different permissions that are in there. So whatever 100 factorial is, it'd be a lot of different roles that you can build. It's a joke. With yes, there's templates. So you can clone the template and then customize it as you need to. Uh, you can also drive role membership off of directory services information. Right? So if somebody's in a help desk group, give them this role or put them in this org or whatever else. A uh, quick question about, you mentioned Avamar and you're using the same deduplication technology now. Because mm -hmm. I've got a client we moved from Avamar to CrashPlan. And uh, one of the things I've kind of missed, so to speak, is the efficiency of the deduplication across multiple devices. Sure. Is that something that'll be part of 4.0 that it'll, because it's, my understanding is right now it's per archive. It'll dedupe that particular machine's archive. Yep. Will it go across devices with a new version? Is that what you're alluding to? Yep. Okay. Cool. Very good. Uh, remember the graph about we're re kind of rewriting the physics of data. Uh, we're sharing share plan and crash plan data right next to each other. It would absolutely make sense to give you some level of cluster-wide dedupe for those large files and things like that. It's, it's really like destination, destination aware kind of data. Yep. 
So with that, we'd like to wrap up. All right, thank you. Uh, I see that you have some things that you were going to yes, give I do. away. Um, um, yeah. And just one last, while he gets that, there's one last house mini housekeeping, is that the uh, we do want to invite you to the party tonight, uh, 6 o'clock at ARIA. Uh, check out the Jamf Nation. <laughs> practice, safe, practice safe sync. Yeah? yeah? That's, that's, that's great. <laughs> All right, and then... I don't know how I'm going to do this. The one question I was going to ask might not be uh, appropriate for you guys. But yeah. Um, can anybody give me uh, or explain to me uh, why we are Code 42, what the name comes from? Hitchhikers. OK. Ward Freetech gave it away. Yeah. Um, this is a good one. How many bits in a byte? Bits in a byte. Ten, twenty-four. Eight. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank you.